I wasn't aware this type of technology existed and could be used in this way. So none of this was available uh, for him. But I've seen this happen in my client population. If all we get is mood rec regulation, like affect regulation, and the person is just calmer and easier to work with, again, I don't have any caregivers who say, I really wish he was aggressive and taking swings at us again. You know, this whole calm, easy to work with thing, man, we don't like it. Like, no, people are like, no, oh, this is demonstrably better. My life got better because this person is more well-regulated, even if we haven't changed the course of their disease, which of course we want. But if all we get was affect regulation and it makes everybody around them have a less stressful encounter, incredibly valuable. Has that clip got you wondering what we're talking about today? Well, welcome Guy Odishaw. He is a bioelectric medicine specialist. And I'm not going to lie, I was a lot skeptical when I got the email from their PR team. But I think after you hear about 60 years of research and what the team over at Cerebral Fit is doing, I think you'll be just as fascinated as I was. Welcome to Fading Memories, the podcast for caregivers of loved ones with dementia. I'm your host, Jennifer Fink. My mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years, and when I went looking for answers, I had to start a podcast to find them. Join me as we navigate the challenges of dementia caregiving together. Through personal stories, expert interviews, and practical advice, we'll explore effective communication strategies, stress management techniques, and ways to cope with the emotional journey. This podcast is your beacon of support and empowerment. Let's share our experiences, find solace, and discover the strength within us. Get ready to embark on a transformative caregiving journey with Fading Memories. If you're looking for additional advice, be sure to sign up for our weekly email newsletter. It's brief, gives you great advice, you can read it in less than five minutes, and you know where to find the link. It's in the website, on the show notes. We're working on subscriber-only information and specials, so you're not going to want to miss out. Unfortunately, it's part of our modern world that some people will look to prey on the most vulnerable members of our society. With modern technology, scammers have more avenues to exploit people than ever before. Americans over the age of 65, especially those living with Alzheimer's and dementia, are receiving an average of almost 200 unwanted landline calls every week. That's more than 28 calls a day from bad actors trying to defraud our loved ones. Even worse, nearly 10% of these calls have no caller ID, making it even harder to distinguish between legitimate and fraudulent calls. Older adults are less likely to be tech savvy and more likely to be home during the day to answer these calls. Please don't rely on notes by the phone as an attempt to stop a crime before it happens. You need IMP. IMP offers advanced call protection and a variety of other features to keep you and your loved ones safe from scams. IMP only allows wanted callers to ring through. Stopped are 100% of the spam, scam, political, fundraising, debt collection, and survey calls before a single ring. Traditional call blockers can't do this and neither can the do not call registry. Don't wait until it's too late Protect yourself and your loved ones by going to www.joinimpasinhall.com. Also, the link is in the show notes. Now, on with our show. Thanks for joining us again, listeners. You know how much I appreciate your time every week. I've got something really interesting for you. With me is Dr. Guy Odishaw, and he's going to talk to us about bioelectric medicine which is not something I'd ever heard about. So I think you're going to find it as interesting as I did. So thanks for joining us. I'm just going to call you Guy because the rest of it gets too complicated for me. <laughs> Perfect. So why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and then we'll go into what it is that you're working with and working with and who you're working with and go from there. Sure. So I'll give you a yeah, quick little uh, biography uh, so I've been uh, practicing in largely what's called integrative manual therapies. It's a general category, but 
integrative medicine is even you know a larger kind of category. So a little over thirty years now, uh, I you know started off uh, teaching, then moved into a professional practice. Ended up at the University of Minnesota, where I helped put together a integrative medicine clinic in the student healthcare system. Uh, was there for about eight years, took that model out into the market to see if it could really stand on its own. So started at that point, my clinic that's still around now, roughly 18 years later, Bhakti Wellness Center. We were for a while the largest integrative clinic in the country. COVID knocked some wind out of our sails. So we're no longer that, but we're still we've got a pretty good group of people. We're about 15 providers in the clinic. We have MDs and DCs and NDs and uh, mental health. And we have a whole brain health clinic where we do neuroimaging and neurofeedback, neurostimulation, uh, massage, body work, aesthetics. So quite a collection of modalities in the clinic. And then uh, somewhere, I, uh, maybe about 12 years ago, I got into bioelectric medicine and incorporated more and more of that into my practice, maybe five years ago, more specifically into the brain side of that. So that's the neuroimaging, neurofeedback, neurostimulation, and a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Then I started a, a, another clinic called the Minnesota Brain Health Clinic, where we focus on just um, Alzheimer's and dementia prevention and treatment. And then the company that I'm really here to, to kind of speak from today, which is Cerebral Fit, which is a, a, a virtual version of the Minnesota Brain Health Clinic, where all we do is everything brain health. Most of the work we do is in the neurodegenerative area, so dementia, Parkinson's, um, dystonia, Huntington's, things down that line, MS. But it is uh, using primarily bioelectric medicine to uh, do in-home treatment. So people can get clinic level treatment at home and, and try and take on uh, a side of brain health that has largely been ignored. So we think mostly of pharmaceutical medicine. If a person is very progressive, they might be doing functional medicine, but very, very, very few people have ever heard of bioelectric medicine, let alone are doing it. And it allows us to, to address uh, you know, we're electrochemical beings and pharmaceuticals and supplements take care of the chemical side and bioelectric medicine does the electrical side of that equation. And so that's what we're going to talk about mostly today is cerebral fit and kind of what we're doing in the space and specifically kind of in the neurodegenerative Alzheimer's dementia space. So just to clarify, when you say integrative medicine, because that's also not a term you hear a lot of that is basically all the different specialties working together, which is not typical of our healthcare system. Am I correct on that? Or yeah, so good question. So there, there sadly is no definition of what integrative medicine is. Uh, it's a term that has kind of evolved from when we had allopathic medicine, or we just had medicine. There was no other form. We just had medicine, and then. There was this, you know, kind of nebulous area that, that was generally referred to as like holistic. And then it was alternative complementary that lasted about a decade. And then alternative complementary then came under the umbrella of integrative medicine. They, they just really took the, the thing that existed and just tried to give it a better name. And that was partly politics uh, as the goal was to bring these other modalities that typically they existed outside of the, the allopathic medical system, at least into relationship with, if not literally into the same building. And, and so, so that was the goal of integrative medicine was really to say, bring something like acupuncture into a, a traditional Western medicine allopathic system. So, you know, Pro probably fair to say, like after 30 years in this, I would say it hasn't worked. And and I don't think it's going to work. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. Mainly, it has to do with money. And insurance company, insurance drives most of our healthcare in the allopathic system. And insurance doesn't pay for, for the most part, there's small exceptions, but for the most part, it doesn't pay for the the alternative or complementary medicine. So, you know, chiropractic, 
uh, massage, acupuncture, uh, energy medicine, uh, even coaching, which isn't really part of the alternative whole you know side of things, but still, all of the things that insurance doesn't pay for. And so the challenge for any one facility is how to pay for this. How do you bring in a modality that insurance isn't going to reimburse? And, and it's quite literally, I mean, this I consult with clinics all the time and, you know, they'll have me come in and ha- to help them, you know, set up how do they structure their clinic. And it's something as simple as, well, here's a room. If we want to do acupuncture, we need a room to do acupuncture in. And I say, okay, guy, how, how much can we charge? Well, you can charge $75 a visit. Great. How many people we, can we see? Well, acupuncture's sessions can be relative, you know, a little shorter than, than some visits. So maybe 45 minutes, you can turn a room so we can get 10 visits in, in a day. Okay. So they, they look at that and go, well, like, like we can make more money in two office visits with a doctor or a physical therapist or an occupational therapist than the entire day with the acupuncturist. What, why would we allocate this room to that? Like we'll lose money. And that's, like that is the the bottom line. Like literally, that is the bottom line, and we see it happen over and over again when they look at a room and say that that space, that ten by ten space, has to generate X amount of revenue because it costs Y amount of revenue. So it has to generate X amount of revenue, and we can't generate that by putting a massage therapist in there. So we're not going to. And there you have it. I mean. It, that in a nutshell is why we don't have integrative medicine in a in a serious way. Um, and there are, are other barriers, but that's that's the main one. It's the financial piece. So we have clinics like mine that are at, at our peak. We had 31 providers. We had we had quite a diversity of modalities represented in our clinic, but we were a non insurance based clinic. We were just a straight cash pay fee for service clinic, so we didn't have to worry about that. And and we were then able to put together a model that could work, but yeah. So the, yeah. So the idea of it is is, and it, it's it's not realistic to have all modalities in one because there's a virtual unlimited number of modalities. So what we like to think of is what we call an, an integrally informed provider. So whoever the the provider is, they have educated themselves on a, in a very broad swath of modalities. So as they're taking a, a, you know, a patient's history, they can think, oh, you know what respond, that responds well to homeopathy, that responds well to uh, egoscue, uh, you know, postural restoration, that responds well to chiropractic. And, and at the end of the visit, they can say, well, here's what we're going to do on an allopathic side. We're going to order these blood tests, and I want you know this done. And then I'd like to see you set up an appointment with you know a chiropractor and a, a GOSCU practitioner and a Reiki provider, right? And then there's your holistic prescription that's specific and tailored to that individual patient's needs. What exactly is, an, I think I'm going to say it wrong, the agostic provider? Agoscu? Egoscue. Egoscue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I knew I was going to get it um, wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's it so you know it's it's a person's name it's a it's a it's a modality um the more recognized form is what's called postural restoration therapy that exists within the world of physical therapy so mostly physical therapists would study and practice uh, uh postural restoration therapy. So uh, Egoscue is a form of that, which is so it's a form of, of, of very structured exercises to restore uh, function, stability, and balance uh, throughout the body, and 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 it's it's brilliant. I mean, I I had many clients that I've worked with. One of my areas is is treatment resistant chronic pain. So clients that I've had for ten years who had we just. We were just the best I could do for them was manage their condition, send them down the hall to the Agoski person, and in a few visits they don't have the problem anymore. So, so, so I'll say Agoski is a brand name that represents a a, a a form of working with the body that has to do with what happens when we get the, our functional units, muscles, and joints 
uh, aligned and balanced and working properly, uh, it can actually sort out a lot of problems. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a Goss cube. Okay, that's cool. I, I'm familiar with the uh, issue of really tight hamstrings pulling on your back. Yes. So you might think my back is bothering me, but really it's because maybe you did a 30 mile bike ride this weekend. Not currently because it's been raining like crazy <laughs> in California still. Uh, we're getting closer to no more rain, I think. Um, but yeah, if you don't, you know, especially <clears throat> as some of us get older, if you don't stretch, your body just does not like you and it doesn't work right. Correct. Yeah. So this, this whole area of, of functional exercises uh, is brilliant and, and it can solve so many problems that a person might, you know, they, they might be seeing their primary care who might send them to a specialist and they might have a surgical consult and they could go down that path or they get routed today, probably more likely they would get routed to physical therapy, which again, physical therapy can include this, but most of the time physical therapy is your standard stretch exercise it's the same thing today that it was 20 years ago and 40 years ago. And it just, you know, that, that unfortunately happens too often, but th there is this body of knowledge around kind of functional movements that are incredibly restorative in, in terms of many of our orthopedic needs could get handled that way. So it's, it's a, it's a good one to have like for us, it was a really important one to have in the clinic because it can handle so much of our orthopedic complaints. So one other side note question. Yeah. yeah. So since you've been in the biz, you know, a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you hear Eastern medicine and Western medicine, they don't generally overlap much. Obviously they overlap more with you. Are we just reluctant to make these changes because people don't like to make changes? We, you know, why, why are we not integrating the, the different uh, like spheres of medicine. Like, I mean, obviously sure. not all Eastern medicine is ideal and not all Western medicine is ideal. So to me, you know, in a simplistic term, it makes sense to do both when you can. Mm -hmm. Why are, why are we not moving that way much quicker? Like, give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, of course, a hundred percent agree with you. Um, the, again, <clears throat> this could be, this could be like a whole series of podcasts. I, I yeah. did five years of podcasts, on this topic, um, but I'll try and give you a couple of quick answers. So one is, I mean, sadly, ego. Uh, you know, we, we at the university we had an opportunity to do an integrative clinic. We had we had great funding with three million dollars to to create this integrative clinic. We got together the the principal providers that we wanted to have, and we did not get any further than fighting about who was in charge. Like literally when we had, and and you can imagine, and I'll say this, and I, I want to apologize to all doctors, all family members who have doctors in their family. We pick on doctors a lot. It's not fair, but I'm going to a little bit here. But the problem was, you know, the doctors were just like, I'm not going to sit at a table where, you know, maybe a nurse is head of care or an acupuncturist is head of care is like no i'm i'm the doctor i'm the head of care and and that we we literally did not get beyond being able to get that group of providers to agree on you know an egalitarian form of healthcare where there was nobody who was in a sense in charge. So one of the big differences at my clinic at Bhakti, how we solved that, we had our provider meetings where we did our case consults and we would have, you know, 10 to, to 20 providers sitting around a table. And in my clinic, we'd have maybe an MD. So we've got a medical doctor, we've got a naturopathic doctor, a chiropractor, a licensed psychologist, a Reiki provider, a, a, a medium, right? Um, and a massage therapist and a nurse. Maybe that's the collection of people around the table all talking about a particular patient and, and what would they do if you had this person come in and present in this way, what would your approach be? And everybody would kind of give their approach and we might 
form a team around that person. And, and, you know, so we might end up with, you know, in one of our, our cases of one of our person who, who had um, complex PTSD, they ended up with the, the licensed um, psychologist, nurse, acupuncturist, and Reiki provider as their care team. And, and, and that person really flourished where coming out of the, the allopathic system, they had had psychiatry to manage their meds and mental health to talk to them. And that was it. And in our setting, adding in um, the acupuncture and the Reiki was totally changed the, 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 that person's trajectory in their healing. And, and yeah, so we had a place where the politics was a politics of cooperation and no turf war. Um, but in, in the conventional system, it was all turf war. And we just, we just never made it any headway. And I see that happen over and over and over again at clinics where just that, that same thing happens where, you know, just somebody on the, on the, usually on the doctor side won't deal with whoever they're being asked to work with, whatever they're, you know, if you're bringing in a homeopath and they're just like, nope, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you, so you guys do go through a lot of education. I'm not sure that I'd want to necessarily uh, have to report to somebody who I didn't feel had as much education, yep. which, you know, it's a, it's a little snobby, but, you know, it's not unrealistic. I mean, it's, yes, no. it's ego, but at least yep. there's some re natural reasons behind the ego. And I'm sure that must be hard to, to uh, yeah. eradicate from your, your belief system. <laughs> Yeah, the only way to fix that is to change our med schools, which that isn't going to happen anytime soon either. Right. So I've been, I've had the good fortune for probably 25 years. I uh, get to lecture at the local medical school kind of once a year, they bring me in. Uh, and, and so I have, this is a little frightening. These things happen when you're around long enough. So I have um, doctors who I was lecturing with them when they were in medical school who have graduated, practiced, had children, and their children are old enough to be in medical school. And now I'm in the room lecturing to them. <laughs> I knew your mom. It's like <laughs> it's nothing so like funny. making you feel old, huh? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so, so, you know, there, there is a few programs, very few programs here in Minnesota. I mean, the, the folks who've been doing this, who haven't been me, I've not been on the front lines of this, who've been just fighting every year, fighting with academic health to let even a little bit of integrative medicine curriculum into the program so that doctors can get exposed to it so that there's a slightly more open mind in that practicing doctor and and it has been successful for sure but we have to keep in mind that it's it's slightly more open mind than if that program hadn't been there and and so yeah it really is an individual personality part it's 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 the it's the provider who again just as a personality issue is more open in terms of less conservative, so that it is the, the doctor who will read the research, like what we're going to talk about today, right? So photobiomodulation for the brain. There's decades of research on that. It's it's not a new thing. It's But I run into this constantly, again, lecturing at the medical school and you know, doctors putting up their hands saying, you mean you can put light through the skull into the brain? Can you explain how that's even possible? You know, I'm like, really? That's the level we're at here that you you don't think light can go through skin? I mean, oh my goodness, we have so much ground to cover. And so even yeah, though that's these, a little surprising because bones aren't solid, solid. Well, I mean, you have x-rays, you have MRI, any <laughs> any kid you know, put a flat, uh, their hand over a flashlight and saw the light come through it, or you put a flashlight in your mouth and it would come out your <laughs> cheeks. Like, like we all know, we don't need a scientific study to tell us 
that light goes through the body. I mean, this is this is just like, of course it does. But <laughs> but I, I mentioned that just because it's so absurd. But but even though there are 60 years of of research on this, there I I do it regularly for my talks. I do a like a, a Google Scholar search and and look at the number of of articles published you know to date in the year. So just to this point in uh, 2023, we have about 13,000 articles, research articles that have been published in the area of of the uh, uh, transcranial photobiomodulation. So that's, so we have 13,000 published pa papers four months into the year. So that's so, 13,000 just this year. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot. Like the, it is, I, I keep up on this stuff the best that I can. Like, <laughs> you know, every day I try and do some of my continuing medical education and try and stay on top of it. I have a, a, a whole group of practitioners and we share information with each other. And so we have studies popping up every day. Somebody's like, oh, I found this one, I found this one. And even though I'm doing that on a daily basis, I don't, maybe I touch 1% mm. of the, the science that's being produced in this area because there's so much. And that to me, that's the crazy thing is, is that, that a doctor can just be completely oblivious that this is even a thing, but also the just average the average person, like some of your listeners, I'm sure like, I've never heard of this. This doesn't sound like a real thing. This sounds like science fiction. And, and one of the biggest hurdles for me, you know, getting over with, with people is, is to understand that, that this, this is solid science. Like pr the, the proving of it is water under the bridge. Like, that was decades ago, well understood by the people who are, who are researching it and practicing it that this is a real, predictable, reliable phenomena. And, and and let's just get to the talking about how this can help and not get weighed down in the, well, what's the science? How do you know? I mean, MIT maybe three years ago released, you know, some research that, that kind of, you know, went through the culture. So they, sh they showed how they could use, a, a, you know, 40 hertz flickering light to uh, treat Alzheimer's and dementia and reduce amyloid. And, you know, it just, it was a very uh, attention getting study, but again, it was, you know, part because it was MIT, it was like, Oh, MIT. Right. But, but that's by passing the tens of thousands of other research papers showing the same thing. But so MIT got some press. Yeah. They, well, no yeah. surprise there. Right. So explain yeah. to us exactly what, and I'm not going to use the big fancy term you used because I couldn't <laughs> even get the other one right. So explain to us what bioelectric medicine is. You kind of hinted at it, light going into your sure. brain. Does it sound a little woo-woo? Um, <laughs> and I'm not, yeah. I'm which I much, much prefer natural. Um, uh, when my daughter was a baby and teething, the homeopathic teething tablets worked a thousand percent better than Tylenol. So yes. I've been, and she'll be 32 this fall. So yeah, it's been, you know, 30 years or so. Um, yeah, I'm much more into natural, just, I don't know why, just them. Yeah. <laughs> so explain I, to us how this works. Sure. Okay. So I, I will somewhat quickly give a, a bit of an overview and then we can dive in deep if we want and and then back out again to a little bit of an overview but i start kind of high level so bioelectric medicine as i said earlier uh, we are electrochemical beings right and so at a, at a cellular level there are chemical processes and electrical processes happening simultaneously and and interacting with one another and so we're very used to, very comfortable with, with the chemical side, right? Your doctor gives you a prescription. It's a chemical. You go to the pharmacy. They give you a, a pill bottle full of chemicals. You take it and, it, and it drives certain chemical reactions in the body. And there we go, pharmacological medicine. So there's the other side of that is the electrical side. And, and we just, it's not, again, not that it hasn't been around for thousands of years as long as there's been humans and really just animals we are all electrochemical so there have been historic treatments 
but it is only now that it is really starting to even do something like come into kind of uh, popular uh, awareness and and be um, both research medicine and the the healthcare consumer you know kind of all meeting in this territory of of the electrical side the bioelectric side so so it, it is you know whatever the device is uh, and we have many 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 different forms of of bioelectric medicine to, to deliver some type of electrical stimulus or stimulate the electrical system in the body. So many, many different types, but all of them are trying to leverage the electric side of the chemical electric to get the body to do more of what we want and less of what we don't want. So that's the, the big area. And probably my number one um, person who I follow is Michael Levin at Tufts University. What he's doing in the area of bioelectric medicine, nothing short of amazing. Everybody should take a moment, go to YouTube, Google, or search on YouTube for Michael Levin bioelectricity. And what he's doing is just, it's nothing short of amazing. Uh, limb regeneration in animals that typically like don't regenerate limbs, um, being able to... Uh, change the morphology in the, the you know the developmental structure of of an animal uh, and doing all of that by manipulating the bioelectric gradient uh, and not touching genetics at all you know he's really turning biology on its head in terms of what he is proving uh, like the ability to take a, a tumor and turn a tumor on turn it off like make a tumor appear and make it disappear, make it appear and disappear by manipulating the electromagnetic gradient is, again, there's just so much in what he's doing. So, so I would say, and to your point of kind of the, the Eastern Western medicine, I think what's coming out of the work that Michael Levin and, and not just him, he's got a large group of people around him. There are, are many, many labs now that are really researching the side of the, the bioelectric side what they're starting to show is what the theory that Eastern medicine would put forward, which is they primarily worked on the energetic side and not the chemical side, although they also did the chemical side through herbs. They mostly focused on the electric side. And, and what we're starting to find now is we're doing more work on the bioelectric side is we're proving those theories right. And, and I think that's the most exciting thing in terms of being able to kind of heal within our culture, the East-West split, is when through our own mechanism of Western science, we open to these other paradigm and they start to become, you know, kind of native to our own model. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, there's a legitimacy here that was always there, but it didn't come through our proof, our our way of of understanding science and medicine, but that's changing, you know, through the work again, Michael Levin at Tufts and their work in bioelectric medicine. So, so that we have this big umbrella. Then if we get into specifically this area of brain health, and then even more specifically into, let's just say dementia as a generic word without being uh, very specific about what that means, obviously the different types of dementia. Um, but so in our kind of primary, what we call our complete kit, the cerebral fit complete kit. We use a, a transcranial pho photobiomodulation helmet using near infrared light um, uh, transcranial into the brain. We use a nasal laser to put uh, red light, so visible red light, but it can also be uh, near infrared, which is invisible. But typically, we use visible red uh, into the nose. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's two lasers you put in your nose that irradiate your blood, your eyes, so that's great for macular degeneration and, and uh, glaucoma conditions like that, but it will make it into the brain. So it makes it into the underside of the brain where we, we can get into the olfactory bulb, so post-COVID smell uh, issues. Uh, it gets into the, the hippocampus, so memory. Uh, so we've got light on the top of the brain, light on the bottom of the brain, and then the third device we use is what's called an audiovisual entrainment device. So it has glasses with flashing lights, headphones with beeping sounds, and typically ear clips to, 
to deliver what's called transcranial stimulation. So an alternating current stimulation. Uh, we modify that such that those electrodes could go actually on the head to deliver a more specific, um, what we call a montage when we're treating a person specifically for a given form of dementia or specific deficit. So what we end up with in our system is we have the, the, the transcranial infrared light, the transnasal red light, the photic entrainment, the auditory entrainment, and the cranial electric stim. So we have, we have those modalities all within this one system. And, and then the, those are all about doing two things, which are really like 500 things. But the two things, the way we think of it is we're affecting brain physiology and brain function. And for conversation's sake, I like to pretend those are two different things, but they're not actually. But we think of brain physiology, let's say, for example, a, a main issue in dementia is the loss of mitochondrial function. So, so the mitochondria produce the energy in the brain. They do a lot more than that, but they get the biggest billing for producing energy. So um, if the energy production is going down, a simple way to think about it is your household. You know, you're running your household. If your income is going down, but your expenses are not, that's a problem. And if if that problem starts off relatively small, and so you kind of manage it through certain things, and you go like, well, we'll do less of this, we'll do less of this. We were going to replace the front steps, but we're not going to. We were going to you know, do these kind of maintenance things. We're not going to. We're just going to kind of just live within our means here. So if you think about that for your house, and then that keeps going, at some point you start to accrue debt, and you're still trying to live the same life you were living, but with less income. So what you have is that your home is is kind of degrading around you. It's not being repaired. Now you're, you know, you've maybe exhausted savings. Now you're into to the debt and you're accumulating more debt. And that whole problem snowballs. Take that same situation, apply that to a brain. When that brain isn't producing enough ATP, so the mitochondria aren't producing enough um, energy, the same thing starts to happen that the brain will start to, to, you know, conserve. So it'll say, well, there's certain things I'm not going to do. I'm going to protect core functions, but I'm going to let some of the peripheral functions go wobbly as, as it maintains the things that it needs to maintain. And that's the condition. That's, that's a neurodegenerative condition. No matter what name we give it, that process is the same. And so we think about a dementia, it's, 15, 20 years of degeneration for that person to present with, with clinically diagnosable symptoms, right? To be able to say, yep, you have uh, dementia. Although, you know, we don't really know that until autopsy, right? But, but we can make a clinical evaluation. So 15, 20 years of degeneration before that, you know, kind of expressing of the, the symptoms that we're willing to call um, a disease state. And, and so what, what we are trying to do with, from a cerebral fit standpoint, using the bioelectric medicine is we don't, we don't see ourselves as treating a disease. Right? We're not trying to, to stop the body from doing something. What we do is we revitalize the organ. So we, by so uh, photobiomodulation, light therapy, it increases mitochondrial activity. So they produce more energy when there's more energy. Just like when there's more money, you tend to start taking care of things. That project you didn't get to, let's get to that. Let's fix those front steps. Let's replace those windows. Let's get that door leveled. You start to take care of the place again. That's exactly what the body does. Is When it has more energy, it starts to use that energy for healing and regeneration. And so, yeah. So, that, And that's just one dimension, right? That's just mitochondrial activity. Um, and that's just looking at one dimension of mitochondrial activity, which is energy production. But it turns out that mitochondria also do a lot of cell signaling. So they, they, they tell other cells and other networks of cells, they give them instructions around what to do, do more of this, do less of that. And so if the mitochondria isn't doing that, well, 
then there's misinformation. It's like an orchestra where the conductor isn't conducting. You know, it's slowly going to get out of sync with itself. So that's what we see happening in the brain. So we have mitochondria, very, you know, core uh, function that they provide in the brain. And we know in the neurodegenerative conditions that mitochondria function is diminished. So if we can rehab that, that's a big win. Then inflammation. So inflammation plays a big role in neurodegenerative diseases. And uh, infrared light is really good at controlling inflammation. So if we can use a, a, a non-drug intervention to downregulate inflammation, that's a big win. <laughs> then there is um, so nitric oxide, nitric oxide, uh, it does a number of things in the body, but you know, keeping it relatively simple, it uh, dilates blood vessels. Um, it helps blood move more out into the capillaries. And, and so, so, so if you think about a, a vascular dementia, well, you have a problem right there by definition. But generally, in an aging brain, we know the circulatory system is becoming less optimal in its functioning. And so anything we can do that increases the amount of blood flow is going to improve two sides of things. One, more nutrients to tissues. So we feed the tissues. That's good. We also take away more waste material. And so we're cleaning the brain. So what, what is one of the things that's happening is the accumulation of, of proteins. So that's our amyloids and our tau's that are you know building up in our brain. So if we can improve circulation, so in the brain, but in the body is called the lymphatic system and the brain is called the glymphatic system. And so we have a blood brain barrier that doesn't let blood directly get into the brain and it goes into the, so we use the, the cerebral spinal fluid as the delivery mechanism. And, and then that's part of the filtration that comes out in the glymphatic system. So when that system, circulatory system, glymphatic system, cerebral spinal system is all compromised because of vasculature issues, a whole series of processes become suboptimal that just add to the drag on the system and the, and the degeneration. So if we can increase and kind of rehab that system, we can, again, vitalize the organ and clean the organ, and we can frustrate the process of, of degeneration. So like we like to say, slow, stop, reverse. And we never know in any one person which of those is going to happen. But again, I haven't had anybody complain if their symptoms stop getting worse. That would be, that'd be good. Yeah, yeah. And of course, everybody wants the reversal. And we see that often enough that it's a reasonable consideration. Uh, but even if we don't get the reversal, for a person to be able to hold steady over a period of years, that's a gift. You know, for mm -hmm. a condition that... the allopathic medical system basically takes as a chronic degenerative condition that has only one endpoint, and they really no viable uh, treatment option. So that typically is the diagnosis that a person is given and left with. And on our side, we say, well, you know, that's, that's not the whole truth. There are things that can be done to, to revitalize the organ and the systems associated with it that at the very least bring hope. And, makes, and of course we, makes sense. We, we see <clears throat> more than hope. I mean, we have, we have good clinical outcomes. We, we run about an 80% efficacy rate. That's, that's high in, in a, again, in an area of medicine where allopathic medicine has roughly a zero to be able to take that zero and say, no, actually, we have about an 80% um, efficacy rate. That's so when you say um, you 80% efficacy, is that slowing or stopping? Or so where? we take it all together. All, so all of those together on the, on the on kind of a spectrum of, of measuring outcomes is slow, stop, reverse. That land that 80 plus percent of our people fall on that side of it. So maybe something in the in the fifteen to twenty percent would we'd say are non-responders. We we can we can 
see no sign in terms of function and, and not maybe show any significant objective measure of changing the course of the disease. So that's in about something that looks like about 20%. But in are those 80%. People, oh, sorry. Are those people generally like a later stage? Or is there not um, a really I mean, a think, place you can put a put a pointer on and say, this isn't necessarily going to help people in this group? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. So, so statistically, we could say that yes, the more advanced the the degeneration, the 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 fewer responders we have in that particular population. So our our efficacy rate is lower there than than if we get an earlier population. Right. So that just statistically, but people aren't statistics. And I have so many wonderful stories of people who were at that place, were on the cusp of, of going into a care facility or were in a care facility who we've been able to bring back and ha they're living a relatively normal life. And when I say relatively normal, it's, it's not like there's no sign of of you know cognitive impairment or other because we think of the brain often in terms of cognition but that's not really fair to the brain you know the, the the brain's kind of the master organ it's running everything so it's hormones digestion temperature regulation uh, you know all, all it's got its fingers in everything so when we improve brain function it isn't just that say memory gets better or you know ability to navigate three dimensional space it's all of those things get better um, in terms of the running of our whole physiology. And, and so, again, we want to kind of keep that in mind. But but being able to take somebody like one of my favorite um, stories is is a lady who, who, again, was on the cusp of going into a facility. The family had reached their limit of being able to care. She she had essentially, you know, kind of, it's not fair to say no quality of life, but but she didn't do much other than lay in bed and sit in a chair and then lay in bed and sit in a chair. That was, that was every day. And now um, she's cooking, cleaning, going, visiting with friends, playing bridge, going to the grandkids hockey games, she's driving. Um, and, wow. and so, yeah. And like, so that happens and, and not like once, but that happens enough to show those of us who practice in this field that like, I don't ever want to say to anybody it's too late because although statistically we might say, yes, you know, your chances have gone from 40% to 10%. That doesn't matter if you're the 10% that respond. And Again, we want to look at this in a, in a, in a in the more most holistic way that we can, which is, of course, what we we all want is that person to recover and be the loved one that we've known them to be and 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 have a quality of life, but also like be a part of my life. 
right? Like that's, that's what all of us want. So maybe we don't always get that. But again, I, I've, I've not had a family complain if all that happens is, so like, I'm thinking of one of my, one of my people who short-term memory became like almost non-existent. So everything had to be kind of re-explained and re-explained. And, and, you know, they're not done their treatment because these treatments presume, you know, we presume them to be lifelong, right? I call it the toothbrush of the brain. You're going to use these devices for as long as you want a brain. And when you're done with your brain, stop using them, right? Just like with your teeth, right? Brush your teeth every day until you don't want teeth anymore, then stop brushing your teeth. Same thing with these devices. This is lifelong. It's like nutrition. It's like exercise. Let's do it. So this person is a little less than a year into treatment. So we don't know what's coming, but somewhat early on, maybe two months in, the reports coming back from the family were, you know, they're starting to get some of their short-term memory back. So when a friend comes to visit, they still know that that friend that came at 8 a.m. at noon, they still know that friend came to visit and we can talk about it. And that didn't exist before, right? So for for the family that was lovely that that it just allowed the nature of the interaction to be different they felt like they had more of their in this case father uh, husband back um now you know did we significantly change the course of the disease what other functions may or may not come back we don't know because it's, it's he's yeah, we're not done with him yet. How will, how will he be in two years and in three years and in four years? Because we we presume revitalizing and re- regenerating the organ, that takes time. You know, we say the disease has had 20 years. Give us a minute. Like, yeah. <laughs> let, let, let us create some momentum in the system to push back against the force of that degeneration. We have a lot of systems to correct. And, and so, but again, in his case, just the coming back of short term memory had an effect on the family that was experienced as positive uh, and less stressful. So that's a side of it we don't always talk about. We get so focused on talking about the person and the condition and how they're doing and are they better and how do we measure it? We forget about things like, you know, my uh, brother-in-law uh, died of, of a very aggressive form of of uh, dementia. And besides that he went quickly, the the end was was pretty rough because he got very aggressive and it, it became you know too much for the family to deal with them. So they had to go into a home. But even there, the, like at some point they couldn't take him and they need to go into a facility that was better able to manage you know, him. And and so but unfortunately, when he went through his process, I was not doing this yet. I wasn't aware that this type of technology existed and could be used in this way. So, so none of this was available uh, for him. But I've seen this happen in my now my you know my uh, client population is if all we get is mood rec- regulation, like affect regulation, and and the 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 person is just calmer and easier to work with. Again, I don't have any caregivers who say, I really wish he was aggressive and <laughs> taking swings at us again. You know, this whole calm, easy to work with thing, ah, we don't like it. Like, no, people are like, no, oh, this is demonstrably better. My life got better because this person is more well-regulated, even if we haven't changed the course of their disease, which of course we want, but if all we get was affect regulation, and it makes everybody around them have a less stressful encounter, incredibly valuable. Yeah, that repetitive questioning, you know, they tell you just like, I had a guest a couple of years ago where, you know, she was very loving to her husband and, you know, she's written a book and he would ask the same question over and over. And one day she just sighed and rolled her eyes and turned around and looked at him. And she said, it looked like I had slapped him. And of course she felt terrible. And so she went through the mantra of if he could remember, he wouldn't ask. He didn't ask for Alzheimer's. So that was kind of her mental mantra 
so that she didn't ever do something natural. Like, oh my God, he's asking me that question for the 17th time. I mean, that's completely a normal reaction, but his reaction to her made her feel so guilty. And that obviously he probably felt terrible that he frustrated her. And, you know, that's a, I mean, that's, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but I know, you know, as a caregiver and, you know, I'm sure the listeners are like probably shaking their head. Yeah. I'd love it. If, you know, my mom used to ask me, well, what have you been up to lately? Like literally every two minutes. And after I gave her the five answers that I could give her for what I'd been doing that day, I wanted to slam my head into a wall, which is obviously not good for brain health. <laughs> and it just, no, it was, we don't, so, we don't recommend it. No, it's probably, I, I, did, <laughs> I used to get headaches all the time. Um, but yeah, no, it's not a good idea, but it was just, it was like, I wouldn't mind sitting around shooting the breeze with you, but I got to have a little bit more stimulation here. It was so very hard for me to just, just be with her where she was at. Cause where she was at wasn't very, you know, it wasn't much. Yeah. And so that yes. was a real big challenge for me. So that, that is a huge thing and not being aggressive. If they can remember their best friend came and visited them after breakfast, you know, three yeah. or four hours later, they're not going to be frustrated or agitated that nobody comes to see them because people have seen them and now they can remember. So that actually really is huge. So. Yeah, exactly. I, I feel the same way. Even, even though we all can all have this sense of like cheering the disease, like, yes, I would love that, but, but no, not yet. Uh, but you know, but we do see these wonderful, amazing results. And and of course, that's what I want. That's what the families that I work with want. But it, but we don't want to dismiss. And I'm glad that you said what you said is even if this is what we get for that family, that is welcome. It, it, it absolutely is. And that's what, you know, I often say is like, like, I, I don't have it. I don't have families complain if they only get a 2% gain. Because they're happy for that 2% in a condition where you lose 2% continually to get 2% back, that's a miracle. And so, so even the small gains are valuable. But also what you remind me of when you were sharing that is I highly recommend that the caregivers use these devices. So not just the person with dementia doing those, absolutely. But let's say you know our protocol is two 30-minute treatments a day. That's that's our standard protocol. So that means 23 hours a day, those devices aren't being used. And, and so the caregiver uses them to manage their own uh, kind of mental health, energy level, brain health resources, just build those internal resources so that they're able to show up as a, as a more well-resourced caregiver. And that that helps everybody. That helps the person that they're caring for, but exactly in the way that you describe is if, if we get, like if we lose our patience, if we get short tempered, then we feel bad about that. So if I can expand my resilience so that I am less likely to have that moment, that's fewer moments I have to feel guilty. And, and so I'm doing myself a favor by regulating my own nervous system to, you know, to have the ability to show up and, and, you know, often these, you know, the person in this role is in that role for years. And there's the impact that that has on them of years of that when that person either goes into a home or passes. And now it's back to them putting their life back together. The, the more of you that is there and intact just means you get to do that, that your your return is 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 a gentler return. You know, it's it's just easier to move back into the life you had three years ago, five years ago, 12 years ago, however long that care period was. So yes, yeah, so these devices are not just for the person with the condition, they're for everybody in the sphere. And and then if you're like us here, my wife and I, anybody in the neighborhood who has anything or just like run over with one of our devices, here, put this on. <laughs> so so yes, I mean, they, they, once you have them, they're an incredible resource. They can be used for you know many, many people. And um, uh, so 
and so maybe I should say uh, again, I, I kind of described the system in that we have a helmet, we have glasses, headphones, we have a nasal laser. It also has ear lasers, so you can put red light into the ears, which can affect um, uh, ear-related issues, so hearing loss, tinnitus, things of those nature. Um, and but the the protocol would be to you know, for in our in our clients who are able to do this themselves, then they set themselves up in the case where they need some help, then, you know, a spouse, a family member or a caregiver is going to help set them up with the devices. And what I recommend is you kind of create what I, I call the, the command center, a place where the devices are going to live. And ideally, they're out. So they're easily accessible. Chair, couch, bed, wherever that place is, where you can just sit down put the devices on, press the start button. Most all of them are very simple. One or two button presses to, to activate them. They remember the protocol that you did last time. So often it's, it's just turn it on, press start, delivers the treatment. Um, that we you know have this recommendation, 30 minutes twice a day. You know, you know, can a person do 30 minutes once a day? Yes. Can, a, can they do 30 minutes every other day? Yes. It's a, it's a, you know, the, what I say to folks is, it's like, imagine you want to, you want to be healthier. You want to decide, I want to be healthier. I'm going to approach this through diet. Great. So guy, do I have to eat? Like if I eat one healthy meal a week, will that do it? Well, maybe we could aim higher. Could I eat three healthy meals a week? Sure. Do you think we could get one a day? Like one healthy meal a day? Okay. But optimally, we all know what we should have, which is we should have three meals a day that are all healthy. Like that's how we should eat. We know that. That's not simple. We don't need a <laughs> double blinded, you know, research study to tell us that if we want to be healthy, eating three healthy meals a day is better than eating one healthy meal a day and two junk food meals. It's like, no, it's just, no, it's obvious. So it's the same thing here is this is nutrition for the brain. So doing two treatments a day is just going to be better than doing one in, in you know, again, it, it's not that difficult. It's not that time consuming. It's, it's not unpleasant. Um, at, at worst, it's just kind of neutral. It just seems odd, right, to have these flashing lights and beeping sounds. And he was like, this is odd. But, you know, many people just genuinely enjoy it. And, and they may enjoy that they get to take a 30-minute nap. Or for 30 minutes, they're kind of off duty and nobody gets to bother them. But if nothing else, what people enjoy is how they feel afterwards. You know, just feeling more vital and able to function. Like it's a pretty self-fueling uh, cycle once people start to use the devices and they start to feel the effects. They want more of that. And, and so, you know, we have a pretty good compliance rate because we have good outcomes. So where can people find you on the internet so they sure. can learn more? Sure. So uh, cerebralfit.com. So okay. cerebralfit.com. That's our website. Uh, you'll find uh, a number of, of research articles, uh, videos kind of explaining. You'll find the products, explanations of the products. You can go in there and, and purchase a product and I will put it in a box and ship it off to you. <laughs> when when people do, so uh, we understand that this is a lot of technology and there can be just apprehension around the technology. So we do uh, a consult before somebody purchases if they want. So we'll do a Zoom call and kind of walk through the program and, and you know, what, what do we recommend? And, and then decides to purchase we ship them the device when they get the devices we'll hop on a zoom call we'll walk through setting them up programming them laying out their protocol and then they so we do three coaching sessions um, when somebody buys a device so then that third coaching session is whether it's a week two weeks six weeks three months whenever that person or family decides they want to have kind of a, a next conversation, maybe go into a more advanced treatment protocol, then we would do another coaching session at that point. 
there are more coaching sessions a person can buy a package of coaching if they want to do weekly or monthly or, you know there's all, all of those options so there's a plethora of support we have a lot of online videos uh, if a person goes to YouTube and goes to the cerebral fit uh, YouTube channel they can see all the devices and they can see some of our demonstration videos and then if they want to reach out to me, uh, so messages at cerebralfit.com is the email address, messages at cerebralfit.com. And again, I'll just say that it's cerebralfit, F-I-T. So you go to the gym and work out, cerebralfit.com. <laughs> A bit uh, I can spell. I got to think about cerebral. <laughs> cerebral, yes. Yeah. Um, it's not one of those I spell all the time. <laughs> You know, we offer a, a free 15-minute consult. So people want to just call and ask some questions and get a general idea of, of is the program right for them? Happy to do that. We have a 45-minute consult, which is a little bit more for taking a health history, developing a treatment plan, um, and, and really helping a person make that bigger decision about moving forward and how to move forward, what will it specifically look like for them. So that... No, it would normally cost $75, but if, if the person moves forward with a treatment plan, then that consult is free as well. So it, it, we make it as easy as we can for people to learn about the technology, find out what seems right for them or their loved one, and, and then decide to move forward with it. We you know, so we should maybe put some prices on this that could be helpful for people. So... I would say on the lowest end for a device, we're at $200. So the nasal ear laser device, $200. I, I call that the low hanging fruit. It's like, yes, just yes. I don't, I don't care what's going on. Yes, you should have one. It's, it, it will be good for you. Um, so the nasal laser at the low end, the audio visual entrainment device coming in somewhere around $650, little variance there because there are some, um, accessories a person may choose to add or not, but about 650. The bigger expense is the actual um, infrared helmet. That's going to come in around $3,300. And so then the whole package, what we call the complete kit, is about $4,300. So that's the helmet, the audiovisual entrainment, the nasal laser, and the three coaching sessions all in one package. Um, so um, you know, at, at the at the high end, that's a, a significant investment. But the the comparison is, and it used to be, although this isn't true anymore, but it still kind of a, tells you again how long I've been around. <laughs> is it's it's less than the cost of one month of care in a facility, and in if the very least we can do is delay that by a month, the the family has saved money, and. Mostly what we see is we can delay that by many months, two years. And, and that is both a savings of money, but it's, it's, it's a, really it's a quality of life. The, the, the person themselves lives a better quality of life. The family has a better quality of life because they have more of their loved one around longer. And the, that's, you know, really priceless. So uh, I fully agree with that part. Years yeah. of 2017, I went to a convention. It's for Rotary International. And I went to a brain health and peace breakout session, which maybe doesn't sound too bizarre to you. I obviously <laughs> went because of my family history, but brain health and peace did not seem like, you know, it seemed like mm -hmm. peanut butter and pickles. Didn't quite go together for me. Um, I don't know. I haven't tried peanut butter and pickles, but essentially it was, we have this, and this was in 2017, June of 2017. We have this global problem of cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's, dementias, all the different diseases that cause it, X trillions of dollars globally, blah, 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 all the ugly statistics. And they said, if we can just push out, if we can just delay the onset of this disease globally yeah. for five years, yes. like the amount of money saved and improvement of lives. And the bottom line was... Um, you know, if we can delay people getting this disease, perhaps they will, the disease will not live, they will, they'll out, what's the right words? They will pass away before they get to the later stages of the disease, which Correct. obviously is most of us that have gone through the entire process of caregiving know 
that's a, that's a big deal. So, you know, my mom's care three years ago was $5,600. So $4,300 is definitely cheaper than it was. I'm sure it's more now. Yeah. So this has been very yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and those statistics, I mean, they're they're staggering to look at. If if we think in something as simple as so again, not thinking about curing, we all want that, but we're not we don't have that yet. But what we do have are are tools like this. And again, I've talked today all about bioelectric medicine because that is what I do in the company. My partner in the company, uh, Dr. Jeff Drobot. He does biological medicine. He's more kind of on the functional medicine side, working with supplements and things of that nature, medications if needed. Um, my partner in the Minnesota Brain Health Clinic, Dr. Cinda, again, functional medicine doctor. So we do a comprehensive approach where we work with diet, lifestyle, supplements, medications if needed, lab testing. We do neuroimaging. Uh, in the clinic, we, you know, we we have all of the tools. Today, I just talked about bioelectric medicine. That was kind of the, the main focus. But when we bring all of those tools to bear, it's, it is very practical to think that we can do, as you suggested in those statistics, is to push out the, the, the date of disability for that person. And again, when we scale it up to population, if we can take tens of thousands of people and push back the onset of, of critical care disease by a number of years, the savings are massive. And, and there's savings in dollars, but there's also statistics that say the number of caretaker hours that are saved by pushing back that the date of disability. And, and um, so, yeah, I mean, it is a really, really big thing. If all we can do is delay disability, that's still a win. And then, of course, we still want more than that, which, again, we have pretty darn good success at getting more than just delaying um uh, the date, you know, the date of disability, but it's still significant for everybody involved if we can do that. And for us, you know, nationally for our healthcare system, when we look at the, 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 the number of hospital beds, the rate at which hospital beds are being filled by people with neurodegenerative diseases, the rate of care facilities being filled by people who have neurodegenerative diseases is staggering. And so being able to affect that, uh, it's it's helpful. I totally that's, agree. That's, that's I was very fascinated. <clears throat> excuse me when we first spoke about all of this because, like I said, I had not been aware of it until you guys emailed me, and now I find it just amazing that it's not like standard protocol. Yes, yeah. So probably the biggest name in this business is is Doctor Bredesen, the Bredesen Protocol. I'm familiar and with him. Yeah. So, you know, he, he, after I forget how I don't want to prematurely age him, but roughly 40 years, you know, in, in the business, uh, you know, on the allopathic healthcare research side, really working with conventional medicine in the dementia space, basically saying at some point, this isn't working. And not only is it not working now, it's not worked for the last 30 years. I don't see anything on the horizon. I, I want to do something different. And he did this global outreach, pulled together hundreds of, of people who were having success, mixed together their successes, and, and came up with the Bredesen Protocol, which are, here are things that have proven themselves to be effective over time across multiple populations, and that is the Bredesen Protocol. One part of the Bredesen Protocol is the bioelectric medicine, which is, again, that's my area of, of specialty. But... But he is, he has really pushing forth this idea of there is a viable option. They just released a large data set from their you know their own work over the years, showing uh, an eighty four percent efficacy in outcomes. So being able to again slow stop reverse this condition at a at a rate of about eighty four percent, and that is staggering that goes directly to your point of this should be standard of care 
every, every primary care doctor who, who suspects mild cognitive decline should be saying Bredesen protocol and, and turning care over to that program. There are other programs. There are, there are programs popping up now that Dr. Bredesen is kind of pioneering a path for other people to get involved, like CerebroFit. Right? But, yeah. Um, there are more resources available now than just that. But again, he's leading, he's the tip of the spear for making this something that at some point will be the standard of care. Thank you. It's been fun. Wow, thanks. You're one of my power listeners. You've gotten all the way to the end of this episode, and I greatly appreciate it. But I do have one last quick request. Could you go to Apple or Spotify podcast player and leave us a five-star review? In your written review, you can ask a question or just simply state what you liked about this episode. Reviews are the best way to get new listeners, and the more new listeners, the more caregivers we can help. I greatly appreciate it. Now, here's what's coming up next Tuesday. Anybody from anywhere in the world uh, can spend uh, time with me or one of my board certified colleagues. Uh, we can really discuss any aspect of dementia or any other neurological condition that is of concern. And if that individual wants to uh, have access to that GenoScore test, we can send it out to them because that test is only available through a doctor. Unfortunately, you can't go to Walgreens or CVS or Walmart and buy the test. And it takes about four weeks to come back. The test results go to a laboratory and that laboratory does its sophisticated testing to identify and put together these 100,000 different gene products that contribute to the overall Alzheimer risk. And, and then we circle back with that uh, individual and we discuss what that, what that geno score number means and what we can do to intervene and mitigate the risk of dementia later on in life. Thanks for listening today. And we'll be back in your ears again next Tuesday. Please support our sponsors for they help us bring this show to you for free.